It is morning at the Naval Air Station in Jacksonville, Florida. The men in Patrol Squadron 24 stroll the tarmac that since the beginning of World War II has been home for naval aviators. These 12 men are just one of the many teams around the world that fly the Navy's most unheralded aircraft, the Lockheed P-3 Orion. The Orion is not a glamorous plane. It is not fast, nor is it capable of breathtaking aerobatics. Operating from land bases, Orion pilots are unfamiliar with the exhilaration of being catapulted from a pitching flight deck or catching the wire on a stormy night. But unlike Navy fighters, the Orion never needed a top gun school. During the Cold War, Orion crews waged a private but very real war against the Soviet Union. It began over 30 years ago when the threat of Soviet submarines prompted the Navy to replace their aging patrol planes. Named for the Greek god of the hunt, the Orion emerged as the world's premier sub-hunter. Today, the hunter has found an expanded role to match the uncertainties of a post-Cold War world. But despite the collapse of the Soviet Union, a less tangible submarine threat still exists and the Orion still does what it does best, hunt. All right, everybody gather around. Good morning. Our call sign this morning is BP-24. Tactical call sign is BAT-1. Got a six-hour mission going off the coast for a tactical ASW. Today's uh, mission is ASW. ASW stands for Anti-Submarine Warfare. For Patrol Squadron 24, ASW is the primary task. However, other duties include anti-surface warfare, aerial mining, and maritime surveillance. Like all Navy squadrons, VP-24 has an insignia. They are the Batmen. This name derived from the Navy's first radar-controlled anti-ship missile, the BAT. VP-24 tested the BAT in the late 40s and has held the name ever since. Um, does anybody have any questions? Okay, if we have any emergencies in flight, we got a full NATO crew on board. Flight operations in the Orion require that up to 12 crew members each share a separate responsibility. However, flying missions that may last up to 16 hours, they must also learn to get along. Deployed from land bases, Orion crews never have to live aboard a ship. Six-month deployments do, however, place squadrons anywhere from Iceland to Italy. Final flight preparations are made by the pilot, co-pilot, and flight engineer as the crew awaits word from the plane captain to start the engines. The four large Allison turboprops found on the Orion are the same engines used to power the Air Force's C-130 Hercules. The all-gray color scheme has replaced the traditional white and gray of previous Orions. Although not as aesthetically pleasing, the change makes the plane over 300 pounds lighter in paint alone. Paint is not the only change for this new generation of naval patrol. In recent years, the balance of world power has shifted drastically forever altering the well-entrenched military dynamic of the Cold War. However, submarines have not gone away, and although the threat comes not from the Russians, their existence is no less daunting. At 110 knots, Lieutenant Alan Poremba pulls back on the stick and the Orion is airborne. Taking off on an easterly course, our crew will first cross the wide St. Johns River before passing over Jacksonville and on to the tranquil blue waters off the Florida coast. 
A typical ASW mission usually involves a combination of both high and low level flying. The Orion can cruise at well over 350 miles an hour at high altitudes. Upon reaching the patrol area, it will drop down to about a thousand feet before searching for the submarine that may be lurking within the seas below. Okay, we're out here doing a surface surveillance search right now at a thousand feet. We're flying loiter at uh, 200 knots, looking for any targets. Okay, we've got a we've got a sub on the surface. I'm gonna go ahead and turn and uh, see what kind of boat it is. Although sub hunting is a daily chore, every sub contact draws the interest of the crew. Okay, we're going to go ahead and descend down to about 300 feet, and uh, going to go ahead and man the urds, and uh, radar is going to get a check on it. We'll go ahead and see what kind of sub we've got here. Okay, we're starting to get a little better picture of him here. He looks like uh, like a U.S. boat from the bow planes. Most likely an LA class. That's our most up-to-date uh, US fast attack. The ERDS, or infrared detection camera, uses variations in surface temperature to provide a detailed picture of the sub. Okay, our ERDS, uh, ERDS camera just verified that it is a uh, LA class submarine. He's heading roughly on an easterly course. Okay, we're flying over him now. You can see his whole, uh, whole outline in the water. He looks real impressive down here. Water's real clear, and you can just see by the plume he's putting up, he's got a lot of power. He's, uh, he's looking real impressive. Looks like they're transiting uh, out of port, just getting ready to go out on an exercise. You can see, uh, their ops vary. They can do, uh, when they're in port, they can come out and just do two week uh, upkeep periods and do uh, just do some short exercises prior to going on a long term deployment. Next to the P3, I'd have to say, uh, Submarines are probably the best ASW platform that we have in uh, the United States inventory because they can be in the same uh, same environment as, as the subs are looking for, whereas we have obviously have to look for them from the surface. Like the P-3 Orion, the American attack submarine was designed to neutralize what only a few years ago was America's greatest Cold War adversary. We cannot simply assume every nation wants the peace that we so earnestly desire. We're menaced by a power that openly condemns our values and answers our restraint with a relentless military buildup. Throughout the Cold War, high-profile military parades were held in Red Square. However, what was not showcased were Russia's most secretive weapons. They were lurking off the American coastline. With the destructive power 1,000 times the atomic bomb dropped over Hiroshima, the ballistic missile submarine was for years the front line in the Cold War standoff. Victor, Charlie, and Delta-class submarines prowled the American coast, while Poseidon, Polaris, and Tridents kept their sights on the Soviet heartland. Of all the weapons in the Soviet and American arsenals, the submarine and their ballistic missiles were the most highly shrouded in secrecy. While new Soviet aircraft could be photographed by American interceptors during flyovers at a May Day parade, and troop movements and armament buildups could be picked up by satellites, the submarine was always an enigma. With their ultimate refuge being the protective cover of the deep, these stealthy weapons were the most elusive in the Soviet inventory. Despite the emergence of ballistic missile submarines, the traditional anti-ship attack vessels continued to be updated throughout the Cold War. Soviet Victor-class attack submarines carried the torpedo power to literally rip an enemy ship in half. With the addition of the Mammoth Delta-class sub in 1971, the Soviets had amassed the largest submarine force in the world, 
American cities could now be hit within minutes. To make matters worse, the Soviets were also perfecting the lethal cruise missile. Although perceived to be less advanced than their Western counterparts, cruise missiles launched by the Charlie-class submarine could skim over the shoreline virtually undetected. At the height of the Cold War, the P-3 Orion was the front line against the Soviet submarine threat. Detecting the sound of an ever more quiet adversary characterized this ongoing game of cat and mouse. The primary listening device utilized by Orion crews is the Sonobuoy. Before each ASW mission, Sonobuoys are loaded into each of the 48 launch tubes at the rear of the fuselage. It is from these tubes that the sonobuoys are launched when a subchase is underway. The diagonal slant of these tubes cancels the forward inertia of the aircraft, allowing the sonobuoy to land in the desired spot. Anthony Anderson is the ordnance officer in VP-24. Uh, in flight, in flight, we launched the sonobuoys from in the tubes right here. Uh, we have three of these. We call these our pressurized sono launch uh, tubes. Uh, we simply place them inside there with a CAD on top of it, uh, shut the door, and electrical impulse fires a CAD, uh, which pushes the buoy out. In the event these break, we also have what we call a free fall chute right here. You just lift that up, that's unpressurized, put a liner in there, and just drop the sono buoy out. Once in the water, the sonobuoy transmits sound back to the Orion. However, the ocean is alive with activity. Noise given off by both natural and man-made sources results in a unique commotion. It is the job of the sensor operator aboard the Orion to isolate the sound of the submarine from the chaos of the sea. Petty Officer Tim Laws explains. The acoustic station is the first phase of after the sauna buoy gains contact, or the sauna buoy in the water takes all the raw uh, frequencies, noise. It could be ambient sea noise, it could be surface traffic, plate tectonics, and of course we're looking for the master signal of the submarine itself. It comes into this uh, station in a raw form. Once it goes through the, uh, the equipment, the signal flow for instance, we're able to break it down into the ambient sea noise, surface, and of course we're looking for the submarine. The uniqueness about this station is every submarine in the world has its own fingerprint. And no matter what kind it is, it could be a uh, fast attack submarine or it could be a ballistic missile submarine, a diesel submarine as well. Everyone has its own uh, particular thumbprint. Uh, the sensor one and two work together as a team to find that thumbprint or a portion of it in the ocean by taking the sound and putting it on a visual presentation such as this screen here. Once uh, we find the uh, visual presentation of a possible contact, we make a determination if it's a friendly submarine or if it's a foe. Uh, once we make that determination, we find out what kind of oceanographics we're dealing with. Is it direct path contact? Is it closer? Or is it convergence zone, a much more distant type uh, contact? We take that information and we work closer with the tactical coordination, a tactical coordinator, and uh, try to track the submarine. The tactical coordinator, or TACO, effectively becomes the aircraft commander when a subhunt is underway. He is responsible for the plan of action to be taken against the stealthy adversary lurking below. Maintaining complete radio silence, the TACO coordinates all communication between the pilot, navigator, and sensor operators. The Orion has many ways of finding and tracking enemy subs. However, in this game of cat and mouse, both sides strive to be invisible. This is a passive, covert station. We can stay at high altitudes, drop our sauna buoys, and I'm able to get that information out of the water and track the submarine without him knowing that I'm there. Uh, all the other state uh, sensors on board this aircraft 
require us to be at a little bit lower altitude, which puts us a little more risk because it puts uh, sound in the water from the four large engines outside the aircraft. Once we determine that we have contact, the sensor one and two will work together with the tackle to determine what the buoy spacing should be, what type of buoys, because we have different types of buoys on this aircraft, they're used to best uh, suck sound out of the water, if you wish to say, uh, to, uh, to make this whole thing happen. Three decades of hide and seek have given Orion crews ample opportunity to polish their skills against Russian subs. Over this period, the technology employed for the hunt has expanded to counter an ever more quiet enemy. But more important than technology has been the experience of veteran crew members who pass on their knowledge to the next generation of airmen. Being able to identify a Charlie, a Victor, or a Delta-class submarine simply by its sound comes not from the classroom, but rather from on-the-job training. The proficiency with which these Cold War veterans perfected the art of the hunt caused noticeable frustration to the Soviet Navy. In fact, one Soviet admiral was quoted as saying that when he wanted to know the location of his subs, he simply asked where the Orions were operating. At the outbreak of World War I, the submarine was a fledgling technology. However, in the opening days of the war, the Unter's A-boat U-9 sank three British cruisers in just over one hour. The traditional concept of sea power was forever uprooted. Meanwhile, the introduction of air power was off to a less impressive start. Despite its appearance, the airplane did possess two important attributes, speed and long-range surveillance. Early sub-hunting might have been precarious, but it had potential. By war's end, maritime patrol planes were flying dedicated anti-submarine warfare missions. Working together with their ships, airplanes began to take their toll on German U-boats. The resurgent German military juggernaut wasted little time in rebuilding their navy. While the rest of the world was looking inward, Germany again amassed a powerful fleet of U-boats. Prowling within the cold, dark waters of the North Atlantic, lethal German U-boats targeted supply ships, nearly severing the crucial Allied shipping lanes from America. Effectively neutralizing the German sub-threat was crucial to the Allied war effort. U.S. and British Navy destroyers were fitted to the specific role of killing subs. While ship launch depth charges were effective when accurately placed, it was often difficult for a ship to find a submarine. Airplanes, on the other hand, were well suited to the role. The Lockheed Hudson was one of the first planes to patrol the North Atlantic shipping lanes. As one of the first planes equipped with airborne radar, the Hunter could now see through the darkness of night. Thus ended the submarine's use of nighttime cover to surface and recharge its batteries. Soon even the submarine's last refuge, the deep, was compromised by improvements in depth bombs and airborne sonar. At war's end, the Allied leaders celebrated the unified effort that had brought down Hitler. Peace conferences at Moscow and Yalta signaled in a new friendship, a friendship that was brought together by war and would be consolidated through peace. But as history would reveal, this was indeed a fragile unity. The first breakdown in relations involved the German capital of Berlin. Following the war, Russian soldiers blockaded all roads leading into the city. The American response was simple they would get in from above. Without a shot being fired, the Berlin airlift was an appropriate beginning to the Cold War. In Moscow, the second war with Germany in only 25 years had vindicated the centuries-old Russian desire to keep their heartland protected with a buffer of land and troops. 
Stalin championed this philosophy, and the Soviet military machine was given full priority. The importance of submarine warfare was a lesson well perceived by the Soviet leadership. Under the guidance of Joseph Stalin, submarine production flourished, and by the late 40s, the largest submarine fleet in the world was Soviet. The Americans were also aware of the importance of submarines in any future war. However, the U.S. Navy was quick in recognizing that the submarine was capable of doing much more than sinking enemy ships. The German flying bombs that had rained terror on London during World War II had been modified by America and by 1947 were being fired off Navy submarines. The Navy's first submarine-launched missile, the Loon, was soon eclipsed by the more advanced guided missile, Regulus. Like the Loon, the Regulus was fired off a sled from the bow of the submarine. Once airborne, a nearby plane would take over guidance of the missile. Designed to soften an enemy beachhead, the Regulus proved the destructive potential of the submarine. However, it was not the missile itself, but rather what it could carry that drew the attention of the Navy. The dawn of the nuclear age would forever change the dynamic of world power. During Operation Crossroads, the destructive force of atomic weapons was brutally clear, and the race to get as many of them as possible had begun. By the early 50s, Russian Whiskey and Zulu-class submarines were equal to, if not better than, their Western counterparts. Therefore, when the USS Nautilus radioed underway on nuclear power in 1955, it was assumed that the Russians weren't far behind. They weren't. As the role of the submarine expanded, so did the role of anti-submarine warfare. Following on the tradition of the Hudson, the Navy settled on the Lockheed P-2 Neptune. Powered by two enormous piston engines, the Neptune had tremendous range and fuel economy. However, its low dash speed limited its ability to get on station quickly. To resolve this problem, Lockheed added two turbojets. But despite the added speed, the Neptune was becoming obsolete by the mid-50s. By 1955, the Russians test-launched a submarine ballistic missile. The following year, the first Zulu 5-class submarine left a Soviet port, carrying with it two Sark cruise missiles. The need for an updated ASW aircraft became a Navy priority. They wanted a larger plane with greater range, a plane that would be pressurized to provide more space and greater comfort for the crew members. These requirements brought them to an obvious conclusion. They needed a civil airliner. The Lockheed Electra first flew in December 1957 and went into service the following year. The Electra was the most advanced propeller-driven aircraft of its day and was technically comparable with the early jetliners. The New York to Chicago route quickly became its stronghold. But when the Electra's long-range potential was put to use, passengers could travel from Los Angeles to Hawaii in just over six hours. Trouble struck the Electra in 1959 when a Braniff plane broke up in clear air over Texas. Six months later, a Northwest Electra was lost under similar circumstances. The cause of the accidents was found to be oscillation caused by the engines. When the oscillation reached the critical frequency, the wings snapped off at the root. By the time a cure was approved, public confidence had diminished, and Boeing had launched its 727 jetliner. The Electra would never recover, at least as a civil airliner. The Navy chose the Electra airframe to replace the aging Neptune. In August of 1962, VP-8 became the first tactical squadron to receive the P-3 Orion. 
Brandishing state-of-the-art avionics and computerized navigation and attack systems, VP-8 became the most modern and well-equipped squadron in anti-submarine warfare. With a plane that could now endure marathon 16-hour missions, the crew needed facilities to eat and sleep. For these airmen, the Orion became very much a second home. Back here in a galley, this is uh, where we kind of live, and when we're ever on a long flight, we got 9, 10, 11, 12-hour flights, and it uh, gets, gets pretty hard. We got a rack here for the flight station uh, personnel, kind of take a little, uh, take a break, get, get a little shut eye so they're fresh for being in a flight station. Despite the addition of advanced avionics and computer systems, the Navy's Hunter retains many artifacts from an earlier time. The aircraft was derived actually from the old uh, Lockheed Electra. And um, one of the strange things, this here is a hot pot. Over, this is the oven here. And uh, you can fill this with water and heat it up, keep it going. It, coming from the Electra, this, this tube here, you to pull this cap off. And this is actually a baby bottle warmer from where, uh, that's how far back this stuff goes. As the civil airliner Electra was fading from service, its airframe was finding an ever-expanding role for the U.S. Navy. The P-3 was outfitted with a variety of weapons that could be used against much more than Soviet submarines. External wing pylons and increased fuselage space allowed the P-3 to be effective at laying mines and attacking ships. Appropriately, this multi-mission aircraft's first call to duty was not in the role of the hunter. In October 1962, just two months after the first Orion delivery, Soviet ballistic missiles were discovered in Cuba. Subsequent photographs revealed the presence of other military hardware, including the Soviet's newest jet fighter, the MiG-21. As the world stood on the brink of war, Navy ships were deployed to set up a steel fence around Cuba to prevent any further shipment of military supplies. The naval quarantine relied heavily on the location and tracking of any Soviet ships entering the area. It was here that Orion patrol squadrons were first called into action. Flying out of Caribbean and East Coast bases, Orions began the hunt for Soviet shipping. Orion cameras photograph rocket boosters that were spread across the decks of merchant ships. With its tremendous range, the P-3 was able to pick up and track Soviet ships well outside the quarantine line, giving the Kennedy administration ample time to set strategies. After only two months of service, the Orion had already participated in the Cold War's most suspenseful hour. The Orion that flies today is not the same aircraft that flew against Khrushchev ships during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Although it shares engine and airframe, the electronic systems are almost entirely new. While still using the ever-effective sonobuoy and the distinctive metal-detecting magnetic boom on the tail, the P-3C now incorporates an onboard digital computer that integrates the operations of the navigational, avionics, flight control, and weapon systems. These improvements had almost as much to do with technological advancement as it did with the ever-expanding Soviet fleet. During the 60s and 70s, the Soviet Navy grew at a rate which alarmed NATO leaders. Much of this growth was due to the influence and leadership of Admiral Sergei Gorshkov, a man who was determined to make the Soviet Navy the largest in the world. At the heart of this ambitious expansion was the development of the Soviet's first aircraft carrier, the Kiev. The Kiev is not a large carrier by American standards. It is closer in size to the British Invincible class and is thus unable to accommodate a conventional fixed-wing aircraft. But equipped with its Yak 38 V stall aircraft, it represents the long arm of Soviet naval power. To 
add to the new carrier threat, the Soviets dramatically increased their surface fleet throughout the 70s. The proliferation of Soviet warships, notably the Kara-class cruisers and Kriva-class destroyers, gave Admiral Gorskov the firepower necessary to compete with mighty carrier battle groups of the U.S. Navy. In response to the massive Soviet buildup, the U.S. Navy pressed for newer and more accurate anti-ship missiles. The McDonnell Douglas Harpoon missile was modified to be launched from both ships and submarines. Like the feared Exocet missile used effectively during the conflict in the Falkland Islands, the Harpoon is a sea-skimming missile traveling only 20 feet above the surface of the ocean, the harpoon stays below the enemy radar as it hurtles towards its unfortunate target. The updated model of the P-3 has been modified to carry the harpoon missile. The harpoon can be air launched from a range of over 60 miles, provided that the approximate position of the target is known and that no friendly ships are in the vicinity, the harpoon can be left to navigate itself before homing in with its own radar. During the Cold War, the Orion's primary target in such an attack would probably be the Soviet electronic surveillance trawlers which constantly eavesdropped on Navy communication. Despite its intended role as sub-hunter, the Orion is the only aircraft in the Navy fully equipped for long-range anti-ship warfare. Using search radar and infrared detection, the Orion can track an enemy ship even though it remains unseen and over the horizon. If the ship is considered a hostile, the tactical coordinator can either relay its location information to a friendly vessel or he can deal with the ship himself. Almost three decades after the Cuban Missile Crisis, the hunter would again see action against merchant vessels, this time in the Middle East. When Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait in August of 1990, the United Nations Security Council placed an embargo on all trade to Iraq. Within 24 hours of Iraq's invasion of Kuwait, P-3 Orions were patrolling the skies around the Arabian Peninsula. The first task of Orion crews was to provide vital data about Iraqi troop movements. With the fear that Iraq might push southward into Saudi Arabia, this data was critical to the initial placement of U.S. troops. For the remainder of Operation Desert Shield, the Orion engaged in surveillance and interdiction of all ships suspected of violating the embargo against Iraq. On one particular mission, an Orion made a pass at what appeared to be an Egyptian freighter. However, the suspicious crew decided to take another look. On the second pass, the infrared display revealed that the Egyptian markings had been painted over Iraqi colors in an attempt to camouflage their registry. During this period, more than 6,000 ships were intercepted by patrol aircraft. As Desert Shield gave way to Desert Storm, airstrikes ensued and troops prepared for the invasion of Kuwait. During Desert Storm, Orion squadrons began the more aggressive task of hunting down Iraqi ships. In the darkened skies over the Persian Gulf, Orion crews began their relentless search. One of the newest methods adopted to find ships in the Gulf was ISAR, or Inverse Synthetic Aperture Radar. Unlike conventional radar, which relies on its own movement in relation to the target, ISAR relies only on the motion of the object itself. This allows the radar operator to work with a visual image, rather than simply a blip on a screen, thus giving Orion crews better long-range detection. Attack planes like the A-6 Intruder work in conjunction with Orion's on SUCAP, or Surface Air Combat Patrol. 
On one occasion, a radar operator in Patrol Squadron 4 sights a contact attempting to make a run from the Kuwaiti coast to an island base 15 miles offshore. The TACO quickly relays the information to Heartless 501, an intruder already prowling the area. Using his forward-looking infrared sensor, Heartless 501 confirms the target is combatant. During the war, over half of the Iraqi ships destroyed resulted from P3 detection and vector communication. Over Iraq, precision airstrikes pounded Iraqi defenses. Again proving its flexibility, the Orion played an important role in assessing the damage of coalition bombing raids. The U.S. Navy is not the only customer of the P-3 Orion. The U.S. Customs Service has discovered that when modified, the Orion is an effective hunter in a very different war, the war against illegal drug trafficking into the United States. Since the late 1960s, drug runners have utilized private airplanes as a means to smuggle drugs into the country. Flying in at low levels, smugglers had been able to sneak below most land-based radar and rendezvous at remote airstrips, often in the Florida Everglades. In order to track such low-flying airplanes, radar needs to be directed from above. In the expanding war against smugglers, the Customs Service has employed an airborne early warning P-3 Orion. Its distinguishing feature is a 24-foot rotating antenna which houses the APS radar. With one sweep of the antenna, the Orion can survey 196,000 miles of airspace. To launch the P-3 out of Corpus Christi on a typical defense in-depth application, uh, we could uh, depart be uh, down on station in uh, about six hours in the Caribbean Sea uh, and on station for an additional six hours. Uh, stationed there, we could have radar coverage, the uh, 500 miles, which is uh, with our radar coverage covering the coast of Colombia, as well as the coast of Haiti and the coast of uh, Jamaica. And the blue water environment that that represents, there's uh, very, very little clutter uh, that's uh, that presents a problem for the radar. Um, detecting targets in that type of environment is just what this uh, radar was designed to do. And uh, in a way, it's uh, kind of like shooting fish in a barrel down there. Isolating one drug smuggling Cessna in the busy Caribbean requires a rapid process of deduction. Prompting suspicion may be the absence of a flight plan, or even more telling if the plane is not squawking. This means the pilot turned off his IFF transponder. Not a normal move. Once the P-3 isolates a suspicious target, its location and bearing are passed on to custom agents flying Cessna Citations or Black Hawk helicopters. It is here that the chase begins. Using the passive infrared system, the Cessna Citation can sneak behind the suspected aircraft at night giving customs officers the important and sometimes amusing advantage of following the plane without the smugglers knowing that they are there. Using the infrared display, customs agents can read the plane's registration number in total darkness. This information is then sent to the Domestic Air Interdiction Coordination Center in Riverside, California for a background check. At Riverside, highly detailed topographical maps of the southern United States are stored on Laserdisc. During a drug interdiction chase, the bearing of the plane is superimposed from the surveillance screen directly onto one of these maps. This allows the controller to keep all parties aware of any airports, roadways, or clandestine tarmacs to which the smuggler may be headed. I 
Some customs officials boast that their airborne interdiction combination has virtually cut off the flow of drugs coming into the United States via small aircraft. Perhaps this argument is vindicated by recent discoveries of newer and more outlandish means of smuggling, not the least of which was the accidental interdiction of an electrically powered wooden submarine filled with cocaine. One big one. Okay, opening Despite the effective fence created by custom service aircraft, the drug war continues. Fueled by an insatiable American demand, drug smugglers work within a limitless budget. In this multi-billion dollar business, losing an airplane and its cargo is worth the potential reward. It is an ongoing war of attrition that neither side is likely to surrender. There is perhaps no greater measure of Orion's success than its popularity among foreign countries. In 1966, New Zealand became the first international customer to buy the P-3. During the Cold War, Australian P-3s played a crucial role in the detection of Soviet subs. The Japanese have turned to the U.S. Navy's hunter to fulfill their diverse maritime needs. And at the windblown northern base of Andoy, Norwegian Orions have proven that the Arctic weather is no obstacle. While to the south, the Orion has flown over a less forbidding landscape by pilots of the Royal Netherlands Air Force. On the other side of the Atlantic, the country with the world's longest coastline, Canada, has extensively modified the Orion, appropriately renaming it Aurora. Guarding the Straits of Gibraltar are the Orions of Spain and Portugal. The latest Orion export, however, has been to the Far East. Suspicious of their northern neighbors, South Korea is now receiving the Orion. As an ironic portrayal of how quickly the world changes, the Koreans wanted the Orion for its original purpose, hunting subs. Whether the Orion is monitoring shipping lanes, water pollution, engaged in search and rescue, or hunting submarines, it spends much of the time near the surface of the ocean. Salt water is extremely corrosive to any machine, and airplanes are no exception. During a flight, ocean spray is pulled through the engine, wreaking havoc on parts and avionics. This is an aircraft cleaning system, known to naval aviators simply as the bird bath. After a mission, the Orion pilot taxis the plane through a wall of fresh water designed to remove salt from the engines and airframe. It is a sort of daily shower intended to slow the debilitating effects of the sea. The end of the Cold War has enabled Orion crews to undertake the more peaceful roles of rescue and pollution control. However, the Orion will always carry the reputation as a hunter, a role it began a generation ago, a role it continues today. It started off with just a simple headset by just listening to uh, what sound is in the water and trying to pick out what the submarine is. But the Soviets, as well as other countries, got more sophisticated, and that's why we got more sophisticated with our gear. We still listen, we still have the opportunity, but we need this advanced acoustic uh, system here to help us determine exactly where it is, what it is, and how long it's been there. Searching for a submarine on the open and endless sea seems an impossible task. With 80% of the Earth's surface providing refuge, the submarine's greatest enemy is its own sound. P-3 veteran Commodore Paul Semko is all too familiar with the secretive game that came to symbolize the Cold War. Gamesmanship was always on, on noise in the water, on them trying to develop methods to put less noise in the water so that they'd be less detectable, and us developing methods uh, to process noise in the water to be able to detect Soviet submarines. So. That was always the sort of cat and mouse game and, and them using machinery quieting, anechoic coating on their submarines and us using ever more sensitive uh, 
uh, kinds of processing equipment on the aircraft to, to try and, and beat them at that game. We believe that that's one of the reasons that, uh, that made the Cold War come to a close, frankly, is that we felt like we were better than they were and they knew it. With the dissolution of the Soviet Union, the Cold War threat has given way to a new but equally unsettling balance of world power. Political brush fires have replaced the standoff of superpowers. Facing bankruptcy, the Russian government has found that their submarines are more useful on the open market than they are off the American coastline. With third world countries now purchasing the technologies of the Cold War, the role of anti-submarine warfare has come full circle. There's a heck of a lot of unfriendly or unknown countries that are, that are getting all kinds of submarines, whether they be diesel powered or nuclear powered. Certainly North Korea, the Iranians uh, are buying these diesel powered submarines now and they've always been a difficult challenge for, for all of us in this business. So we refuse to give up that dimension, though we've refocused our priorities in terms of the roles and, and missions that we are involved in. We refuse to give up on maintaining our ASW proficiency. So we spend a lot of time at home whenever we get the opportunity on deployment to, to keep those skills sharp because they're very perishable. And if we don't do that, when the time comes, and I think we've all seen in the last few years that there's plenty of hot spots around and that ASW is going to be something that we're going to be called on to do again. It is a new day at the Naval Air Station in Jacksonville. However, the stillness of the Florida sunrise is quickly shattered by the sound of the hunter being prepared for the day's mission. Despite all of the changes that have swept the world in the Orion's three decades of service, little has changed in the morning routine of men and women at Jacksonville and bases like it around the world. The Cold War has ended and the Soviet submarine threat has all but vanished, but the silent war continues. Today, the job may be locating a stricken sailboat, keeping an eye on the weather, or enforcing a trade embargo. Perhaps tomorrow there will be a submarine lurking off the American coastline. From where? A mystery. But what is certain is that the men and women of the hunter will be watching and listening as the world hurtles headlong into an uncertain future. <laughs>